we've heard a lot this morning about continuous delivery. And um, what I'd like to talk about briefly are some of the challenges for both continuous delivery and continuous deployment. So one of the things that becomes a focus for us uh, is that what had previously been seen as a, a pre-production thing, our, our pipeline, as we started to move more towards a culture of um, mean time to recovery instead of mean time between failure and things, we've started to pay more attention to that pipeline, treating it as a production artifact, putting in place the appropriate monitoring and giving it really the care and love it needs to be able to allow us as an organization to push changes through it faster. So really, one of the things that's interesting about that is you've got a means of changing how your software works in production purely by doing check-ins. So what does that mean in terms of um, your automated acceptance or capacity or non-functional testing? Because in the past, where you might have had some mandate to try and get uh, a certain level of testing into your, your build, now you've got an interesting, um, an, an interesting trade-off. Uh, you've got teams that are now being asked to look at the balance between the risk and the speed of their existing test suites. How much value are they deriving from those tests? How long is it taking for those tests to run? How often do they fail? And when they fail, are they failing for good reasons? Or are they failing because they're flappy? They're based upon unstable dependencies. They're failing for reasons other than the code that has immediately been checked in to our master trunk. So green pipelines have become quite an important thing for us. Because as Tyson alluded to, we're looking at the idea of fixing problems that we have in production by making a change and rolling it forward. So if it's our primary means of changing how our applications work in production, it needs to be fast and it needs to be green. So how do you get that way? How do you, how do you, how do you move into that area? Exploratory testing is something that obviously fits well if you've got a, a, a less immediate delivery schedule. So you're going with every two weeks, or you're going with every quarter, or you're going with every year. You can always find the time to get exploratory testing done there. You can bring in your user experience people. You can look at security audits. You can look at those kind of things. The challenge when you come to continuous deployment is that every single commit you make will find its way within typically about 15 minutes or so into production. So what spaces are, or how do you fit into that cadence, the idea of covering risks through exploratory testing around uh, you know, your, your legal liability in terms of infringing the American Disability uh, Act or um, perhaps um, by introducing something that's not really going to work too well for certain users into your user interface or how are you going to deal with things like uh, security vulnerabilities. So exploratory testing is still required, it's still necessary, but exactly how you fit it into that cadence in the context of continuous deployment is an interesting one. So blue-green and canary deploys is also a, a fascinating area for us at the moment because uh, that allows us to really focus on trying to move from um, a model where we, we focus on, uh, as uh, Jez alluded to earlier in his quote in Deming, the continuous uh, inspection. We're moving away from you know, incredible uh, degrees of effort to try and make sure that the software is absolutely belt and braces correct and instead moving towards processes which try and build that quality in. Now, ultimately, there's a limit to how much you can do through testing. I think Dijkstra once said that testing can only ever show the presence of errors, never their absence. So blue-green deploys allow us to get true feedback through using things like synthetic transactions in production. And then if things aren't going well, as attested to by our monitoring, we can roll that back. So that's a very powerful thing for us as an organization. The challenge, I suppose, is how we now, as an organization, I think many of us in the audience will be facing this uh, as, as an issue at the moment, is how we just go towards that when we have large systems. It's easy to take small greenfield microservices, push them through a small pipe, that's fine. The trouble is, how do you get those things to work as part of the existing business services that we've all run today? How do you get them to integrate with your legacy technologies? There's a lot of discussion around um, continuous integration, continuous deployment. Um, and continuous delivery. But one of the things I wanted to focus on today is the importance of testing as we go through this process, right? Because without significant amount of testing, it doesn't really matter what automation you have. Um, specifically, if you're in the type of organization that 
is highly controlled from a production environment perspective, right? So um, there's a definition of what continuous deployment as it applies to our organization. We do not deploy to production for every commit. However, we do deploy to what, uh, what we call a UAT, which is available to our stakeholders. It's not gonna be available to the public, but at least from our stakeholders' perspective, they actually see differences or the value, the business proposition of what the engineers are working on for every commit. Um, and there are foundational recipes in order for us to actually consider continuous deployment successful, right? The first recipe there is mature and agile organization. The second uh, recipe there is agile testing process, um, and I'll dig into that later. Um, effective and efficient tests. And finally, deployment automation and monitoring. These are four components that would make an organization successful from a continuous deployment or a continuous delivery perspective. So I wanted to highlight again um, the importance of agile, to the, uh, agile testing process because it's totally different than a traditional testing process and how effective and efficient the test should be in order for us to embark on this journey. So I wanted to um, give you guys a preview of our continuous delivery process flow. Um, I don't expect you guys to really read through all of the boxes there, but I wanted to uh, put a lot of emphasis on the red boxes. These red boxes are specifically all the quality gates that we have in order for us to actually complete this pipeline, right? So, before we could embark on continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, um, we need to understand how our dev and testing paradigm operates within our organization. And based off the illustration that you guys see on the, on the screen, um, most of the dev and testing paradigms are actually operating as if um, it's truly waterfall. Majority of the organizations that I've seen in the past keep saying, yes, we're doing agile development, but if you really double click um, into the process that they do from a development and testing perspective, it's really waterfall, right? So basically what happens is they do agile development, right, per se, but the testing happens after the developer is completed with their development. I mean, if you really think about it, it's truly waterfall, right? And in order for us to really progress this to the next level from a um, immediate feedback perspective and, and some sort of like um, delivery perspective, we have to iterate this process in a way where we have to do this, right? Instead of actually tackling in from a monolithic um, requirements perspective, we have to break it down into features. And each feature set is actually gonna be tested um, specifically for that specific feature, and every commit for that feature is part of an integration test, which becomes a potential ship shippable feature, right? Um, and this is how we're actually doing it, where it's, it's actually not getting deployed to our production system, but rather a shippable feature that is available to our stakeholders. Uh, one of the benefits here is that in the traditional <laughs> um, software development is that you've been developing for weeks or months, and once the, um, the stakeholders actually get to preview what you've built, most of the time they're gonna say, this is not what I wanted, right? In this model, they are part of the process where for every commit or for every feature that is getting developed, you're getting buy-in from the stakeholders where you need, to, you need to showcase what you've developed so far and get feedback and iterate from there. Um, so what is the secret sauce? Well, there's really no secret sauce, right? But from a leadership perspective for all of you guys in this room today, one of the things that I think is important is provide organizational transformation to Agile, right? I think is very key. Um, and as leaders, we need to foster and encourage this mentality to all of our individual contributors or engineers that time to market plus embedded quality is a sure win, right? especially for the emerging markets that we have today, time to market is key, right? But most often times, time to market oversees quality, right? Sometimes, yeah, just push it out to production, right? Without so much quality, as long as we get ahead of the game. Well, the, 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 the better formula there is making sure that you are time to market, you have time to market, as well as embedded quality, and that's a sure win. Um, the third thing is modernize the technology stack, right? 
as uh, previously said in, in previous um, speaking engagement, um, you have to architect your system properly in order for you to uh, progress towards a faster development life cycle. Um, fourth thing is invest in people, testing, and tools. Um, having this new capability of being able to really automate tests in a very fast and effective manner is not trivial, right? You need to invest in people. You need to make sure that they are very much equipped with all the skills that they need in order for them to do the job. And lastly, develop a process and foster continuous improvement, right? As we're all talking about agile development, it's more about always iterating and continuously improving stuff. So is the process. The process is not gonna be stagnant. The process will always be changing and you should always be adaptable to the new technologies that would make your lives easier. I have been uh, doing DevOps, quote unquote, for Capital One for the last five years. I started it. Uh, I can share a lot of stories around it. Some are funny, some are painful, some are uh, not so well. Uh, but uh, for now, I'm going to focus on certain aspects of uh, challenges that I faced personally uh, as far as deployment things to production or maybe pre-production environments is concerned. So uh, even now, uh, I, I kind of go into teams and talk about uh, DevOps and continuous integration and deployment. Uh, there are a few things that I have noticed that kind of detects uh, at, at a high level what are your challenges are going to be. Number one is deployment pipeline design. Now, the question is, what are you trying to deploy? And, and you know, is it a single war file, or is it a full stack application? All these things matter depending upon uh, how you have architected your applications. Number two is uh, risk mitigation. Uh, now, when you talk about deployment automation and zero touch deployment into production environment, uh, being a bank, everybody will, first, uh, will ask you first thing, how do you roll back? What are the risks? Can I do a control rollout? Uh, how about zero downtime? Uh, you cannot be browsing your you know, banking uh, software and then uh, suddenly you come back and see the application is not working. Uh, and then uh, uh, the, the most important thing for us is, is uh, security compliance. And I'll briefly touch upon certain things that we have done to uh, address these challenges. Deployment pipeline design. So as I said, the first thing is uh, you need to find out what you are trying to deploy. Is it a single stack application? Is it a full stack application with uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, dependencies around, uh, which means that you need to have a, an orchestration process to deploy your application? Does it have database with persistence? Is it schema based or no schema? Uh, somebody mentioned no SQL. Yes, that's one thing that eases out your deployment process, but that's not the, the, the you know, it, it doesn't solve everything. Uh, immutable stack, uh, baked images like Netflix you guys do. Uh, we are also, uh, you know, using containers to, to uh, remove some of these challenges. We run production load on containers on cloud. And also the whole discussion around microservices, the whole idea is to get your dependencies out of the picture so, so that you can ship out a small thing to production just in a continuous manner. Uh, the next thing is where we are trying to deploy. Deploying into public cloud, private cloud, or, or virtual machines in data center. In our experience, in my experience, doing the continuous deployment in a data center based uh, uh, infrastructure is quite difficult because I do not want to wait for an infrastructure to be made available to me two months down the line when I know that I'm going to send something to production uh, in the next one month. So these are certain uh, things that, uh, that we kind of address uh, uh, through our pipeline design. The next thing is managing risk. Uh, to roll out in a controlled fashion, we employ uh, blue-green deployment. And I can go deeper into what blue-green deployment uh, means, to, uh, maybe at a later phase during the panel discussion. And then we actually took blue-green to another level, which we call N minus one, N and N plus one deployment, meaning the current running production load is N. The next one that is being prepared to be released is N plus one. 
And since we need to maintain API versions uh, or you know, backward compatibility, the older version is always N minus one. And then you keep rolling it around that. If any case, uh, in any situation you need to roll back, you basically switch your traffic. Uh, feature toggle is, is one more thing that we, 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 we employ. The rollback mechanism is switching back. Since you are doing blue-green, it's easy to switch back. The other thing is we, are, we have started doing is actually rolling forward all the time. Now that I am sure that I can deploy a, code commit, uh, deploy a committed code to production in a few minutes or maybe 20 minutes, why should I roll back? Let's roll forward. Security compliance is one big thing, embedded security in our pipeline. So from code commit to going to production, we have all the security checks embedded into the pipeline so that nobody has to manually look for security con concerns or security things into the pipeline or deployed code. Automatically record every change in a central place so that if the auditor asks who changed what, why, what point, and where did it go, we can actually trace the whole thing back in one shot. So uh, I'm going to talk about some tooling at Netflix that we've built to facilitate continuous delivery and deployment. Uh, this was mentioned earlier, I believe yesterday and probably this morning, but at the end of the day, continuous delivery and continuous deployment, it facilitates speed. And speed is a tremendous competitive advantage. Uh, in fact, our good friends at Walmart, the uh, for, former uh, CIO, Roland Ford, is quoted as saying, you know, that, that is the only competitive advantage left in this today's business world, is to move fast. And if you think about it, Netflix is, is not really a video company or a, a content company, but really a data company. We are constantly analyzing data and using that data to figure out what content we should buy, what content we should produce, what we should tweak on the website, what we should tell you you may want to watch tonight. And so we want to be able to act really quickly on that data so that you end up watching something tonight, and tomorrow night, and the next night, and for the rest of your life. Um, and so the, the cornerstone of that competitive advantage is Spinnaker. And it's, a, it's the realization of, of years and years of kind of one-off continuous delivery solutions at Netflix. So uh, Spinnaker supports pluggability all around in that Spinnaker is multi-cloud aware. Netflix is heavily invested in AWS, but we partner with Google, Pivotal, and, uh, and recently Microsoft. So Spinnaker can deploy to, obviously, AWS, but it can deploy to Google Compute Platform. It can deploy to Cloud Foundry. And uh, in the coming quarter, it will be able to deploy to Azure. It also supports a flexible deployment model in that we can deploy pretty much anything, as was previously mentioned uh, in the previous panel and, and just now. Uh, Netflix's bread and butter is deploying AMIs, AMIs, uh, VMs. Uh, but increasingly so, we're looking at containerization and containers. And so Spinnaker is capable of, of having a container go through a continuous delivery uh, pipeline. But not just containers, but we can do regular artifacts like jar files, uh, JavaScript applications, uh, you name it. So flexibility on both ends. As my esteemed colleague Mike alluded to, uh, Everything we do is designed to be self-service. Uh, Spinnaker itself is an encapsulation of best practices, again, that you know, we've, we've established at Netflix. All those best practices and tools and services are, are manifested under the umbrella of Spinnaker so that teams can take use of them. Uh, there are other teams that are building various tools and components for, for engineers at Netflix. For example, uh, automated canary analysis is, is built by another team. Squeeze testing, uh, all those services are under the umbrella of Spinnaker, they're, they're integrated into Spinnaker so that any team at Netflix can get, you know, take advantage of those things. As those services are updated, as new ones are built, they are made available in Spinnaker. What's more is Spinnaker uh, embodies some of those best practices like you were talking about. Uh, the rest of the world calls it blue-green. We call it uh, red-black. That's what its proper deployment strategy is called. Uh, <laughs> That's because our logo used to be red and black. Uh, anyways, so red-black deployments, or uh, you were alluding to kind of you know, N, N plus one. We call it rolling red-black or rolling pushes. All these best practices are captured in Spinnaker. Global deployment windows. Uh, Netflix is a global company. We increasingly have a, or I shouldn't say increasingly, we have a cyclic model by which people tend to watch Netflix at night, not during the day, hopefully. Uh, you're at work. Um, and so we can take advantage of those, uh, those windows and deploy when uh, teams feel, feel it's appropriate to, let's say, deploy to Europe on a downtime. However, those are not enforced, but they are then provided to those teams to, uh, to make those decisions as they see fit. 
and we support a wide breadth of pipelines. So while we have all these tools, uh, and as you were talking about some of the challenges with pipelines, is we leave that up to teams. Uh, as Mike alluded to, or actually he said in the previous uh, panel, uh, we enable. We aren't the uh, the bottleneck or the, the stop. The, we, we don't do deployments for teams. Uh, teams own their own software and do their own deployments. They own their own destiny. Uh, we provide the, the mechanism for them to do so. So we see uh, pipelines across the board in terms of doing deployments to uh, server applications, let's say on AWS. We have teams that are deploying to Akamai, deploying uh, you know, JavaScript applications to CDNs. Uh, teams leveraging different services within AWS to deploy to S3 or you name it. So uh, again, a wide breadth of pipelines for teams to own their own destiny. Finally, we open sourced it so that you too can use Spinnaker. <laughs> uh, and, and so Netflix has a long history of open sourcing things. And the reason we open sourced it is one, uh, we wanted to make sure that we weren't wearing blinders in terms of uh, we wanted to see what the other uh, innovative companies out here are doing and ensure that we, we were doing something complimentary. Uh, and we also wanted to uh, take advantage of the innovations that other companies out there are doing. So that's why, again, we partnered with you know, Google and Microsoft and Pivotal. Um, and more companies have come to the table in terms of wanting to take advantage of this ecosystem. So again, that plugability makes it so that uh, innovations from one company can be uh, leveraged by other companies. However, uh, as we've all uh, alluded to in all these panels, there are challenges with this and, and Netflix is not perfect in any way. Um, and so the challenges we're seeing with our continuous delivery model and our platform are, I want to talk to, uh, to three of them. And the first and foremost, uh, and again, my esteemed colleague Mike talked about this, is we want to lower the cognitive load for developers. Um, right now, we're, in, we're a global company. We have many regions throughout the globe where people de you know, deploy services. And all teams own their destiny and own their own deployments. Um, we want to take a step back and say, at the end of the day, do teams really need to worry about deploying to Europe and Asia and US? At the end of the day, they just need to make a global application and deploy it, and it'll uh, It'll be deployed to the globe. Um, you know, one thing you were saying, Jez, about uh, not only should deployments be uh, boring, uh, but you, you talked about the, the notion of a uh, push button. And uh, interestingly enough, the, the idea of push button deployments uh, is certainly supported in Spinnaker, but at the end of the day, we also want it to be completely automated. We don't even want a human to push a button. We want it to be uh, event-driven, so when um, someone checks something into source code, it goes all the way into production, i.e., you know, continuous deployment. But we're continuing to add uh, abstractions to make it easier and ultimately even faster for people to push out features to our customers. We're also starting to look at efficiency. Uh, we make heavy usage of AWS, and uh, we have a platform which to manage all those deployments, and that is Spinnaker. And now we can take advantage of looking at how we could uh, squeeze out uh, potential efficiencies from from the cloud. Uh, interestingly enough, the, the, the lady from Verizon was talking about um, cost per bit. Uh, something we examine is uh, cost per streaming start. And we have all that data so we can start to look at this and, and aggregate it and figure out what can we do to be more efficient. Containers play a large role there in terms of being able to potentially uh, squeeze out more CPU cycles, let's say, on, on boxes in the cloud. And last but not least, uh, speaking of containers and, and, and the, the, the tidal wave that is crashing upon our industry with containers, uh, is it's giving us uh, a chance to rethink our entire model when it comes to global deployments. Uh, Netflix spearheaded a, a model by, by which you have applications, and applications have clusters, and clusters have auto-scaling groups. That's a very much AWS-centric model. Uh, as I alluded to, we are a global company with multiple regions, and people right now tend to think in terms of, I deploy to Europe, I deploy to Asia, I deploy to the US. Uh, but it, and at the end of the day, they really just need to deploy to the, the globe and let something like Spinnaker take care of the rest. And which has us thinking, do we really need service teams worrying about auto-scaling groups in various regions? Not really. Do we need them to even worry about clusters across the globe? No. All they really need to care about are applications and the, the systems that my team and other teams build uh, under this umbrella will take care of that, uh, those concerns for those teams.